from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, and we are pleased to have a publication day party for Ralph's second book, which was published today, The House at the End of the Road, the story of three generations of an interracial family in the American South, which is a different subtitle than we found, it, than we put in our press release. Uh, and that's something that Ralph can address because the subtitle initially was a story of race, identity, and memory. And I think that may be a more accurate sub, uh, description, but we'll let Ralph address that question. We are pleased to not only have you here, but once again to uh, continue our series of noontime talks, which are videotaped for broadcast uh, on the library's website and on the Center for the Books website. Uh, we will, Ralph will speak for about 40 minutes, and we'll open it up for questions and answers and have a book signing starting not later uh, than 1 o'clock. Uh, there will be questions and answers, and if you have questions and answers, you are giving us permission to use your words and your image, perhaps, uh, in the videotape Q&A part, part of our videotape a little later. Along those lines, uh, please do turn off all Blackberries and all things electronic. Uh, so we can keep our record of more than 100 uh, webcasts going with a, a minimum number of blemishes and uh, errors from both the audience and from the introducer. Uh, Ralph's first book, and I will say a word or two about it, uh, Ever is a Long Time, A Journey into Mississippi's Dark Past, uh, is in many ways the takeoff point for what we're going to hear about uh, the brand new book. And it's a most interesting, not only interesting, but moving uh, description of his own family and his own search for his identity and his background, uh, told from in a detective story kind of way, as you, uh, if those of you who've read the first book will realize he uh, made some discoveries about his own family in archival records. And he pursued those archival records with diligence and all of the great skills he's learned at the Library of Congress, where he has been the head of the publishing office since 1995. Uh, Ralph uh, tells, continues that story, and that is the story that we're going to hear today. He also just told me that uh, he will be uh, speaking at Politics and Prose on June 18th. Uh, all of this is wonderful uh, publicity for the library in so many ways, not just because Ralph works here, but of course of the stories that he's telling about his own family and the natural connection that people make with stories and genealogy and history and archives uh, in a very important time uh, in our country. Which, believe it or not, brings up very quickly the National Book Festival. We have a book festival on uh, schedule for September 26th. We have not yet officially announced it because we are hoping very soon to be able to announce that uh, President and Mrs. Obama will be honorary co-chairs of the Center for the Book. Now, I hope I'm not jinxing anything by mentioning this, but we have waited quite a while for this announcement, but it but it's needs to be a coordinated announcement with from the White House first and uh, the Library of Congress but I think that this will be a wonderful vote of confidence for the Library's Book Festival and for a continuation of these author talks, and I hope that it will uh, uh, help strengthen the overall reading and book and literature promotion side of the Library of Congress. Uh, Ralph is going to take over right now, and let's give Ralph Eubanks a round of applause and a good start. Ralph. Thank you, John. Uh, John's right, this does have a bit of a start from my first book, Ever is a Long Time. In my first book, I have two paragraphs about my grandparents, because one of the things I learned as I was going through the Sovereignty Commission files for that book was that one of the reasons that my grandfather's picture could never hang in my house is that you really couldn't claim kinship with a white person in the South or 
back then, they actually did send out investigators to kind of check you, actually check to see the children. If you had half moons on your fingernails, you were, you were black, and I, I don't have any half moons on my fingernails. So it's all, all one of those, those myths. Um, <clears throat> but that's really where it started. My editor wanted more than those two paragraphs. And I said, but that's all that I know. So I decided that I would try to, to find out more. And one of the things, you know, as John said, my archival research skills being honed here at the Library of Congress, I didn't have a lot of archival resources for this project, which was very discouraging to me. And I have to say that at some point, as I was conceptualizing this, <coughs> excuse me, I, I thought I was going to have to give up. <coughs> excuse me. Because it just seemed, what am I going to actually use to tell the story? What tools am I going to use to tell the story? But another thing that I've learned here at the Library of Congress is how much you can learn through collecting oral history, which is what I set out to do. And I started out collecting some of that oral history by sitting with my mother, with my son sitting on the other side, in a StoryCorps booth right outside of the Madison Building. And we did that one afternoon. And about a month later, I took my children to Alabama with me. And my mother tells the story about you know, how you get to the house, what the road looks like, where you turn off the road. And I have a really lousy sense of direction. So we're going down this road. And my son says, turn there. I said, are you sure? He said. That's exactly where Bab is said to turn on the road. So I turn the car around, I go back, and that's it. I hadn't been there in 20 years at that point. But that's just the power of oral history, and I think that's what really got me started with this. So I used a combination of oral history uh, and some archival uh, research to pull the story together. And because my, my grandparents didn't leave a lot of information behind. They were an interracial couple in Alabama. You couldn't claim to be married. Uh, it was punishable seven years hard labor. And if they had any documents that said they were married, they would have been sent to jail, potentially. So all of the legal documents that I started looking for always said James Morgan Richardson, an unmarried man, Edna Howell, an unmarried woman. And they, they kept all of their legal documents that way. And that's what really got me started on being able to tell the story. All those little pieces and seeing how land was deeded and exchanged between them and all of those little details started to fill in the gaps. And then collecting the oral history from the few people who were left behind. Uh, and I was very fortunate to get to talk with a number of people before they died. I have to say that by the end of the project, four people that I had interviewed had died. So it was really, I, was, I feel very fortunate to have been able to have gotten them at that particular moment in time, people who actually knew both of my grandparents, which is, I was very lucky to have that. I'm going to read a little bit, and I want to, I think, to tell you a bit about how I got started. So rather than telling you how all of this started, that's one, um, one part of the story, but there's another part of it as well uh, that started before I even went into that StoryCorps booth with my mother and before you know, my editor wanting to know more and my mother telling me after my first book came out, said, well, Ralph, it was a lovely book, but you could write another one with what you left out. So <laughs> things that I've, I left out. And some of the things are things that she never told me. And this is, so the prologue starts with something that she never told me. The hardest thing I ever did was to ask a white man to marry his daughter. I heard my father say late one night to my mother when they thought I was asleep. Then there was a pause as my father took a drag on his ever-present Salem cigarette. And I'm not sorry that I had to do the asking. It's all been worth it. The two of them laughed tenderly, which I felt in their voices, since I could not see the expressions on their faces. It was 1973, and I was an innocent 16-year-old, blanketed by a naivete, 
lying awake in a room filled with childhood toys and model airplanes. Though I tried to listen in as my parents talked into the night about how they forged ahead with their marriage in spite of different backgrounds, I remembered almost nothing of their whiskey and nicotine fuel discussion. Rather, I remember how puzzlement filled the air of my room like the smoke from my parents' cigarettes and crept into my brain as I attempted to process that my mother's much-loved father was a white man. My grandfather died six months before I was born, so I knew him only through the stories my mother told. I just assumed that since my mother was black, so was my grandfather. His race was never discussed, and in Mississippi in the 1960s, it would not have been discussed without severe social consequences for my parents. Now I understood why my, parent, why my grandfather's portrait sat in my parents' closet, emitting a dusky evanescence from behind the closed door. Yet that evening, overcome with adolescent narcissism, I thought only about how what I had just heard affected me. The impact of my mother living in a mixed race household in the Jim Crow South of the 1930s stood invisibly in a dark corner of the room. With a consciousness rooted in black pride in the civil rights movement, I quickly concluded that my grandfather's race had nothing to do with my racial identity. Soon I was fast asleep, leaving my parents' conversation to drift into the night air. Almost 30 years later, memories of that evening began to come back. My mother and I were together with my daughter Delaney in her school for a classroom presentation about holiday memories. After the children told their stories about family Thanksgivings, Delaney innocently asked my mother to tell her about the most memorable Thanksgiving from her childhood. Holding tightly to her emotions, my mother struggled to tell Delaney about a special Thanksgiving when her mother's friend, Miss Callie, came and made a big dinner just for the children and played games with them. It was painfully clear to me that that was all she could say without losing her composure in front of a kindergartner. When we left the classroom, we stopped on the front steps of the school on the way to the car. What happened that Thanksgiving, Mom? I asked quietly, sensing that she was still upset. Then, standing ramrod straight and glancing directly into my eyes, my mother began to tell me a story I had never heard. This time, I did not let my thoughts drift away as I did all those years ago. Instead, I listened intently as the memories etched lines in the pain of her face. When my mother died, for a brief time, I felt like I became invisible, she told me. And the Thanksgiving I was trying to talk about was when my mother died. My mother, Lucille Richardson, was only seven years old at the time, old enough to know what had happened to her mother, but young enough to slither through the rooms of her house unnoticed by her father, who was devastated by his loss. My mother recalled that all the mirrors in the house were covered with thin white sheets, perhaps to keep her mother's spirit at rest. That made it easy to sneak around. As she surreptitiously watched her mother being placed in a casket, wearing a powder blue dress with a white lace collar, a dress her mother had sewn with her own hands, Lucille wondered what would happen to her now that her mother was dead. In spite of her ability to hide and eavesdrop, she struggled to decipher what the grown-ups around her were saying about her future. Then, just days after her mother's burial, she found herself sitting on the back seat of a 1936 Ford with her nine-year-old sister staring through the car's rear window as her white clabbered farmhouse at the end of the road got smaller and smaller in the distance, finally fading into one of the clouds of dust that billowed behind the car. Sent to live with relatives in Mobile, Alabama, separated from the home she loved, her older siblings, and her father, Lucille did not know when she would return. Before she could come back to her house at the end of the road, her father had to figure out what to do with his family. Would they stay in Alabama, or would they move north to pass for white? It was something that was whispered about among the family, something Lucille overheard, and finally connected with an incident from a few years before her mother died. That day, her father, Jim, was injured in a logging accident a few miles from their house. 
After the accident, a group of men, all of them white, brought him to the house. Confused by all the commotion and her father's cry of pain, Lucille turned to her mother's friend, Miss Callie, who had helped form her most vivid Thanksgiving memory and asked, what's wrong with Jim? To everyone, including his children. Her father was known by his first name without any, out any pretense of formality. Good God almighty, little girl, I didn't ask them what was wrong with that white man, Miss Callie replied. Confused, Lucille turned to Miss Callie and asked, is my daddy a white man? Miss Callie then shouted with disbelief to Lucille's mother, Edna. Edna, why didn't you tell this little girl that her daddy was a white man? Because it's her daddy and it doesn't matter, Miss Callie. But now just three years later, whether you were black or white did matter for some reason. The family's future seemed to hang in the balance between the black and white worlds they straddled. The town doctor who pronounced her mother dead offered to help the family start over, far away from rural Alabama, as a white family. Even some of her lighter-skinned black relatives talked about how the Richardson family could slip into the white world unnoticed. Although Edna was black, all the children's birth certificates said they were white. So it would have been easy. In the end, Jim Richardson chose not to hide his children's mixed race behind a lie. The family was reunited, and Jim chose to make his children acknowledge who they were, rather than to see themselves the way the rest of the world chose to see them. To this day, no one in the Richardson family has regretted making what seemed at the time the harder of two choices. This is the story of why they made that choice and how it has reverberated through the family for three generations. So it was that story that my mother told me on the, the steps of my daughter's school that really set all of this in motion for me and made me want to learn more about who my grandfather was, who was the person in the portrait, and I think moreover, who was the person and the portrait that was supposed to be sitting right next to my grandfather, my grandmother. No pictures of her exist. So I set out to tell this story by trying to paint a picture of who both of them were, who these two people were, who were kind of um, unknown to me for, for much of my life. And I, and I had to, to dig very deep and hard. I had to go, as I said, into land records. I, learned of a, a murder that my grandfather had committed. And I spent an entire day going through the papers to, to f in a courthouse trying to find what had actually happened that day, only to learn that that had probably been thrown away because his parents had gotten him out of the charge. Um, going to look for other documents and discovering that my, the reason, one of the reasons that my grandfather probably was never arrested was because they had real first family status in this part of Alabama. Their land had come from a grant from George III. So they were British loyalists. And they were able to keep that land when Alabama, the, the old Mississippi Territory, went from English hands to Spanish hands into American hands. So they were very crafty people. And that was, and I think my, my grandfather inherited that craftiness. Uh, what I want to do is just read very quickly to give you a sense of where the story takes place in Alabama. It's a very special place. It's a very unique place. And it's also a place that is going to be gone very soon. Much of it ha is gone. And that was the other um, reason I wanted to tell this story, was because I knew that no one would remember anything about this little town of Prestwick, Alabama or the neighboring town of Carson, where my grandfather lived. These were two towns that were very important in that part of Alabama. They were sawmills. They were right on the Southern Railroad. But all of that's gone now. Uh, yet, this is the interesting thing. Uh, when I drive there now with my GPS so I can find my way so that I don't get lost, when I cross those railroad tracks where my son told me to turn, and it says Prestwick, Alabama, it says you have reached your destination. So it is still, it is in my, my GPS. And, it, and it's funny, it's a, it's a British GPS. So it says, it doesn't say you've reached your destination. It says you have reached your destination. So, <laughs> which seems a little bit out of place where I am. Uh, what I, I just want to mention, um, this also took me down some, a couple of other paths. I ended up having my DNA analyzed, looking at this through 
um, through science. And it really transformed the way that I personally thought about race. It completely deconstructed the concept of race. And as I was telling a friend of mine last night, I realized that the as I, this story went on, and I actually took my daughter with me to Alabama, who asked me, said, why does all of this stuff matter so much? That I didn't really need to have my DNA done to deconstruct race. It's the next generation that's already doing that. Uh, and perhaps it's because of what we know about DNA and science and that out of the, all of the various parts of the human genome, there's only an infinitesimal amount that really gives skin color and other physical characteristics. So it's quite insignificant. But I want to just give you a sense of where this story takes place. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful place. And I just want to paint a picture for you, and then I want to take your questions. Um, the first chapter of the book is called The World as They Found It. And this quote stood up on my bulletin board for a long time as I was writing it. And it's from Joan Didion. It says, a place belongs forever to whoever claims it hardest, remembers it most obsessively, wrenches it from itself, shapes it, renders it, loves it so radically that he remakes it in his image. And I think that's what Presswick, Alabama was for my grandparents. The canopy of moss hanging from the old live oak trees gives this place a torrid primeval beauty. As I walk down the winding sand-covered roads, I'm overcome with a peaceful silence that's interrupted only by the soft murmur of the soles of my shoes moving through the sand. There's not a soul in sight. Then I turn a corner and see it, an abandoned church covered in vines and wisteria, the first sign that there was once a real community here. Around the next corner stands a trailer home with abandoned clutter in the yard. After a few more twists and turns, there sits a white clappered house at the end of the road that everyone around here will tell you was the, was the home of the most important family in this now deserted town of Prestwick, Alabama. Prestwick disappeared without a trace from the Alabama state map more than a generation ago, about the time the nearby whistle stop Hamlet of Carson met the same fate. In the years since their respective post offices and general stores shuttered their doors, almost every sign of these once vibrant communities faded away. As I wander these roads, I stop and ask people what this place was like years ago. First, they hesitate. It's almost as if the little that remains of the past and the present makes it painful to speak of the distant glory of these communities. After a pensive pause, they start to tell me about those majestic trees that look much as they did years ago. Some even speak of them as if they are the only friends from the past they have left. The older residents are right. The grandeur of the live oak trees is about all that remains of Prestwick. There are people here, but few of them are young, and the older ones are slowly dying. What once brought Prestwick to life has disintegrated into the dusty road under my feet and under the headstones of the cemeteries I pass along the way. The railroad tracks near the site of the old depot bear a brown coating of rust from lack of use. And with strong winds from storms off the Gulf of Mexico in recent years, some of those much prized majestic trees are fading into memory as well. Storms combined with development of large lavish houses for weekend hunting and fishing parties from nearby Mobile will soon erase what is left of a world lost. In spite of it all, Prestwick, Alabama clutches tightly and lovingly to its former glory as a largely independent black community. From 1890 to 1910, Prestwick, like the rest of Washington County, grew at a rate double the rest of the state of Alabama. Still, the area remained relatively isolated with an average of 13 people per square mile. The community's ancient appearance is just one sign of this once isolated way of life. Another is the White House on the Ray Cinder Block Foundation at the end of the road, just past the now deserted Mount Moriah AME Church. Like the family that once lived there, the house is the survivor of many a storm. Though rocked and battered, it looks much as it did for almost a century. The street sign that points the way to the house reads J. Richardson Road. In this rural isolated setting, a green reflective street sign seems somewhat out of place. 
But without it, there is no way to know that this was once the home of Geminette and Richardson, two of Presswick's best known, and some might even say notorious residents. Jim was born in 1887 down the road in what was then called Carson, a mostly white farming enclave. Carson was one stop down the railroad tracks from Prestwick, an independent all-black community, with the exception of the white-run sawmill. But it was to Prestwick that Jim, a white man, chose to take his wife, Edna, a black woman, to live in 1914. Jim and Edna Richardson were my grandparents. That white clabbered house on the Cinder Block Foundation is a place filled with stories, mysteries, and secrets. The house remains in the family, kept standing by my first cousins, Jimmy and Carolyn Jenkins, who live there and serve as the custodians of the memories and history created within its walls. At the time of Jim and Edna's marriage in 1914, interracial marriage was only discouraged by Alabama state constitution. By 1929, when their last child, my mother, was born, it was declared a felony, with penalties set at two to seven years of hard labor. So that's really Prestwick and Carson, these two communities that I, that I visited and learned and got to know a lot of people who are related to me on both the black side of the family and the white side of the family. I ended up writing a lot at a cabin that's just down, um, just a bit from where my grandfather kept his moonshine still. He was a logger. He was a bootlegger as well. And one of the things that I would keep there as kind of a touchstone was one of the, the rings from the, um, from the still, because it was, a, it was I guess he, it was aged in oak, so it was, he had rings around it. And I heard that it was really good. Um, and I only wish that I could have a, a taste of it myself. But one of the things I, I did was try, I was, it's interesting, I, for doing this book, I researched a lot, I collected a lot of oral history, but it also took me a lot to poetry, to try to figure out how some of these stories went together. So one of the things I want to conclude here and, and then take your questions, and this is another one of those things that stood over my desk, was a poem by Robert Hayden called Frederick Douglass, which really inspired me to think about my grandparents, about their relationship as what he calls a beautiful, needful thing. And I, as throughout this, I would think about this poem. It was in my uh, journal, and think about what was this beautiful, needful thing that they were trying to bring into their lives, into the lives of other people. And that's one of the things that kept me going with this project, even at times when I would get very frustrated with white relatives who didn't want to talk anymore, um, people that I would sit with for hours who would tell the same story over and over again, and, and even, I think, just frustrating even the best interviewer. Uh, and fortunately, one of the things I would have to do is I would take my cousin Jimmy along with me, who I found had superb interviewing skills for someone who's not trained as a journalist. And he would, he'd know what questions to ask the people because he was familiar with them. He would just kind of dive into those discussions. But this is the poem that really inspired me and um, to write about them in one of the chapters is called A Beautiful Needful Thing. When it is finally ours, this freedom, this liberty, this beautiful and terrible thing, needful to man as air, usable as earth, when it belongs at last to all, when it is truly instinct, brain matter, diastole, systole, reflex action, when it is finally won, when it is more than the gaudy mumbo jumbo of politicians, this man, this Douglas, this former slave, this Negro, beaten to his knees, exiled, visioning a world where none is lonely, none hunted, alien, this man, superb in love and logic, this man shall be remembered. Oh, not with statues rhetoric, not with legends and poems and wreaths of bronze alone, but with the lives grown out of his life, the lives fleshing his dream of the beautiful, needful thing. So this book is really a memorial to the beautiful, needful thing of my, that my grandparents had in their relationship. And I hope that it's a fitting memorial, and I hope that you enjoy reading it. Thank you.
Uh, two, I two items I didn't mention earlier. Uh, Ralph received a Guggenheim Fellowship to complete this book, and he took it the first seven months of this uh, year. Uh, secondly, he I can sense Ralph is moving in a parallel direction with his two successful books now because he is uh, teaching at George Mason, teaching writing part-time, and I know enjoying it very much. Finally, uh, the book just arrived yesterday, I'm told, because it is today, yesterday was the publications day, and he has a couple of wonderful blurbs, and one I'm going to read and then turn it back to Ralph uh, for the question and answer period. Uh, this is from Richard Ford, a writer that we've tried to get to the National Book Festival, and now that I see this blurb for the first time, I'm hoping Ralph can use his connections uh, to help us, but here it is, and it's a, a wonderful uh, statement and summary of Ralph's accomplishment. Eubanks' story about his grandparents, an American mixed-race couple living openly and precariously in the cold heart of the 1920s Jim Crow Alabama, enacts the liberating magic of literature. It finds its truth in between conventional wisdom and sociological presumption, in between lies and faulty history. It is the story of race, of family, of place itself, and it tells us that compassion and the stirring force of individual human endeavor finally mean more than anything. And my final instruction to you and to Ralph is, when you ask a question, Ralph, would you please repeat the question before you answer it? Let's turn it back to Ralph. Thank you. So I'm ready for first question. Uh, I see one right at the very back. Yes. Ah, that's um, the 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 question is about advice that I could give to someone seeking a publisher. Is that the, the uh, I guess the the advice that I would I would give is the advice that I give to to every writer is to to find a, a literary agent, and that's that's the that's the first step, and and that's I, that's not as easy as it sounds, but that's really the the first step that I tell every writer, and that would be my advice to you. Uh, yes. What does the adjective post-racial mean to you? Well, the post-racial to me as a term implies that we have had a conversation about race in this country, which we have not. That means that we have moved beyond that. So it's, I, I think post-racialism is, is an idea, and it's at, at this stage. We haven't really gotten that conversation going. And one of the things I'm, I'm hoping to do as I go around the country and talking about this book is to start some of that conversation. And I, uh, yesterday I was on NPR's Talk of the Nation, and the calls just kept coming in. People really want to talk about topics related, sub, related to race and identity, their personal identities, how it affects their families. That's what the show focused on yesterday. But what, real, what I took away from that um, being on the show yesterday is that the people who called in all talked about their children, and that their children were in a very different place than they were. And it confused the parents, but not the children. So they're at a very different stage. It's that millennial generation that thinks more in, less in terms of race and more in terms of justice. And those are the those are the issues that shape their conversation. I'm, you know, as I talked about the night that I discovered that my grandfather was white, I'm shaped by the civil rights movement and the black power movement. I, it's really difficult for me to move beyond that, but I, I have begun that process. It's a beginning, but not all of us are there. So that's what the term post-racial means. Yes, the back. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. 
That's a very good question. Dr. Bedsoul, who was the family doctor, did that for the family. And he, he, that's, he did a lot of things like that for the family. For example, when my parents got married, he changed the birth certificate to colored so my parents could get married because they wouldn't have been able to have gotten married. So it's something that when you start to, you look at it and you think, gosh, how could anyone manage that? There's so much that I learned that the rules that you, th that you think apply just didn't apply. People didn't follow the rules. And my grandfather was someone who clearly did not follow the rules and knew how to get what he, what he wanted. I mean, the, the rules were such that, for example, my, um, my mother could not inherit the property when my grandfather died, and he knew that. So he deeded property to all of his children several years before he died and left a portion of it to um, his own relatives, and all of his liquid assets went to them. They couldn't inherit them. That, that was the law at the time. So it was, a, it was really a way of skirting the law. So yes, Peggy. Yes, the Ku Klux Klan. Um, yes, the question is, did, were my grandparents' lives ever threatened? And the answer is, is yes. The Ku Klux Klan did come down the road wearing their sheets with their cross on fire. Uh, and some of the people under those sheets were my grandfather's relatives, as close as first cousins, I am told. And, but this is a house at the end of the road. Think about it. They, they get there, and you're his. So he, you know, he takes the gun out, puts some buckshot in, sends them packing back down the road, and they never came back down there again. So it's, they were threatened, yes. But I, I think another, the other thing that, that I think shielded them is, as I mentioned, my grandfather was a bootlegger. A bootlegger knows everyone's secrets. He keeps those secrets. And then he uses those secrets as currency. And that's what I believe my grandfather did. And that's what everyone tells me that, indeed, he did do. So, yes, did you have a question? I did. I was wondering what your children were about because they, they were shown an interest in writing? Um, the question is, have my children shown an interest in, in writing? And the answer is, is yes. All three of them have shown an interest in writing. My, my son right now is uh, in a creative writing class um, at school, and my daughter uh, won a writing award last year when I was on my leave, which was a, which is a great thing, and I was able to, to spend some time with her on that. And she, but she never has me edit her. No one wants me to edit them. <laughs> so, and, my, and, my, and my son, Aiden, when he was nine, wrote a fantasy novel, which is you know, sitting in his closet, but he still writes. Uh, but, as I said, no one wants me to edit them. So, um, there are, I'm going to start here with, with you, please, in the front. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the question is about DNA testing and what I hope to find and what I did find. I took the DNA test. I was working on a, a piece for the Washington Post Outlook section. I went to a class on race relations at Penn State. And I was there the day the students got their DNA uh, results. And they talked about you know, what you find out is you're not who you think you are. Uh, you go to, I went to the geneticist's office, Mark Shriver at Penn State. He has a whole wall of photographs there. And it's got who the person, what the person thinks their ethnicity is, and then you pull it up and you see what the DNA tells you that it, their, their real admixture is, if you will. I wasn't sure what I wanted to find. I didn't want to find anything. But the interesting thing that I did find is I found that I had 6% East Asian ancestry which kind of puzzled me. So I did sit down with the geneticist, and he took me through the charts. 
but what that did for me, I think a lot of people get a DNA test and they look at it in terms of the one drop rule. So I've got this percentage of African ancestry, I'm black now. And for me at least, sitting with him and looking at the entire human genome, looking at all of these other results, is it completely, you know, demythologized the whole concept of, of race for me. And I started to think less about it than more. He, the geneticist even offered to do a matrilineal DNA test to find out where that East Asian ancestry came from because he thought, you know, it could come from your grandfather uh, if there is some Scandinavian ancestry because a lot of people in Scandinavia have some percentage of Asian ancestry which I found very interesting since my grandparents' marriage was illegal because of laws for racial purity, which means he wasn't racially pure. But after, um, after I finished, um, I was driving back from State College, I thought, why does all of this matter? And so I chose not to have the matrilineal DNA test and just decided to move on. So yes, um, I think Patricia, you had your hand? Well, there, there are a couple of theories about that. Uh, one is that I believe that they met through my grandfather's social network. You know, he was a logger. A lot of his most trusted uh, men in his logging team were black. A lot of the people he trusted in his moonshining were black. And this is the other component of it that plays into it. My great-grandfather had two families. He had a black family and a white family. They did not, the wives did not acknowledge each other, but the children, interestingly enough, did. And my grandfather was very close to a half-sister by the name of Lola, who I remember visiting in Pascagoula, Mississippi as a little boy. And I believe it's through that whole social network with his, this other, with his half-siblings that he met my, my grandmother. Um, I learned of another story that he was horsewhipped by my great-grandmother because he uh, had taken up with a tenant farmer's daughter, which was a white tenant farmer's daughter, which you know, these were people who were at first family status. And she had married up. She didn't want him to marry back down. And she horsewhipped him. And a lot of people wanted to say, well, he married my grandmother to get back at her for that. But you know, that's when I went around finding stories, and I found a story where a woman who was a relative said, no, it was nothing like that. Said, you know, he really loved her, and you know, he, you know, he really gave up a lot for her. So it really, it changed the way. But that's, it's, it's interesting how this, you have to go around and hear a lot of different stories to find out what exactly went on. But I do talk about both sides of it in, in the book. And there was another question in the same section. Yes. Well, thank you. you know, she's thanking me for, for writing the story. I, I you know, thank you for, for listening today. It, I feel very, very honored to be standing here today uh, telling you the story. My, my good friend Paul Hendrickson always reminds me that he said, not everyone gets to tell their story. Not everyone gets paid to tell their story. He said, you're very, very fortunate to have had this opportunity. And Ever since he's told me that, that's what I tell my writing students. I know at this point, you may not have an agent, you're just working, but when that actually happens, never forget that someone paid you to tell your story. And that's a very special thing to have happened. Yes, Barb? Did you record your oral history? I wonder if you talk a little bit about the white history. I did record. The question is, did I record? some of my, my interviews. Yes, I did, and I took, uh, um, some of them I recorded, some of them I just took extensive notes because people didn't want the tape recorder there. Uh, that was what was really difficult for me. They didn't want the tape recorder. Uh, 
Now, what I did do for some of them, I collected over the phone, and I did get permission. Was I recorded those conversations over the phone. But I took extensive notes of those, of those evenings that I had with people who didn't want um, you know, their stories recorded. Uh, and some of my, my white relatives really did not want the stories recorded. Yes, at the very, very back. Uh, <clears throat> um, I guess the interviewing tip that I would have for, for someone to, to pry the information out, it was really appealing to them personally, letting them know that it was something noble that they were, were doing by telling this to me, reminding them that they're not going to be around forever and that when you go, this, you know, all of this goes with you. That really appealed to several people that I spoke with. Uh, I also had a little bit of help in getting some of these stories going. Uh, Roy Hoffman, a writer at the Mobile Press Register, learned about my work through the grapevine down there and did a story about what I was doing. And then people started calling me uh, here in Washington. And I went down and I had names, addresses, and I went around starting to collect it. But some of them, after a few months, got cold feet. Uh, so I, I experienced the same thing that you experienced. They would send me to someone else. But others just wanted to, to talk because they knew that when I'm gone, this is going to go with me. Or they saw it as, a, as repaying a debt. And that was another way that I also um, kind of cast the conversation with some of them. So that, that helped too. We have time for one more or one more question? Yes. Um, talk about the subtitle if you Oh, I will. Um, the original subtitle is the story of race, identity, and memory. And at the, the time the, that subtitle was set, the book was being published by Collins. Collins closed in January. So after Collins closed, it goes to Harper, uh, which is a, you know, a completely separate sales force and everything, and marketing force. They decided that they wanted a different subtitle. They wanted a subtitle that told more about the contents. They thought that the, they said, you've got your poetry in your main title. We need something really descriptive in the subtitle. That was my instruction from the sales force. So I missed the subtitle, the first subtitle. But I have to say that for some people, this seems to really catch them. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy for that guidance from Harper salespeople. Well, we concluded. Thank you, Ralph. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.